Hello, and welcome to the Murder House Radio Show. On this show, we will be covering serial killers, killers, mass shooters, disappearances, true crime, and all that good dark stuff. The Murder House Radio Show will be a radio show slash podcast. I'll be uploading videos every Friday at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, so sit down get comfortable, grab some coffee or your preferred beverage, turn off the lights, and enjoy the show. Today's show will be about Robert William Picton, a.k.a. Willie. He was born October 24th, 1949, and he's a Canadian serial killer who was convicted in 2007, so uh, pretty recently of the second degree murder of six women so uh that's what he was convicted of he was arrested in 2002 he was the subject of a lengthy investigation that yielded the evidence in numerous other murders picton was charged with the deaths of an additional 20 women many of them from vancouver so he killed within vancouver downtown east side But these charges were stayed by the Crown in 2010 for whatever reason. We'll get into that later. Picton was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. The longest sentence for murder under Canadian law. I think that might have changed, but I'm not sure. At the time he was sentenced, but uh, yeah... I think that changed because I'm pretty sure you can get life without parole now. If you ask me, I think most of Canada's laws are good, but the time you get for certain things doesn't make sense. Like, I'm comparing this to American laws for most states or whatever. But, uh, yeah. During the trial's first day of jury evidence, the Crown stated that Picton had confessed to 49 murders to an undercover agent from the Office of Inspector General who was posing as a cellmate. So that's pretty ballsy to go asleep with a serial killer, basically. The Crown reported that Picton told the officer that he wanted to kill another woman to make it an even 50 Well, at least he had his priorities straight. (laughs) And that he was caught because he was sloppy. Yeah, this guy wasn't anywhere close to done when he was uh, doing his killing. He got most of his victims that were uh, escorts and all that stuff. So he's able to fly under the radar. And in Canada, we have a big problem with the police having prejudiced against Native American women. It's pretty fucking sad, if you ask me. But um, I'm pretty sure that's how he flew under the radar. And he was known for having big parties and having seedy people around, I guess you could say. He would hold these parties on his farm. He owned a pig farm. And he was actually known to dispose of the bodies by feeding them to pigs. Like, he would cut them up and feed them to the pigs. So that's what his thing was. Alright, so there's a little bit about him. So here's his background, like his early life and all that stuff. Robert William Picton and his brother David owned a farm in Portland, Coquitlam, British Columbia, 27 kilometers east of Vancouver. Worker Bill Hiscox called the farm a creepy place and described Picton as a pretty quiet guy whose occasional bizarre behaviors, despite no evidence of substance abuse, would draw attention. The Picton brothers began to neglect the site's farming operation. They registered a non-profit charity, the Piggy Place Good Time Society, with the Canadian government in 1996, claiming to organize and coordinate, manage, and operate several events, functions, dances, shows, and exhibitions on behalf of service organizations, sports organizations, and other worthy groups. That's an interesting name, and I don't know why they would do that, but maybe it was just a cover for their wild ragers they would have. Its events included raves and wild parties featuring Vancouver's sex workers, 
aka Pictum, Picton's Crimes, and gatherings in a converted slaughterhouse on the farm in 953 Domain Avenue in Port Coquillum. Hope I said that right again. These events attracted as many as 2,000 people, and members of the Hells Angels were known to frequent the farm. So, uh, yeah. So if there's seedy characters like the sex workers coming in and out of the farm, that wouldn't uh, raise too much suspicion. Like, he's known for throwing parties, lots of people come and go, and you can't keep track of absolutely everyone. But I'm also pretty sure his brother wasn't a part of these killings. Like, his uh, Robert Picton did them all, and his brother was just kind of there partying and stuff. I'm pretty sure. But could you imagine that, though, just chilling and going to a party at a slaughterhouse? A converted slaughterhouse with a bunch of bikers and prostitutes. Low-key sounds like a good time. Just on the low. Just on the low sounds like a good time without the murder. On March 23rd, 1997, Picton was charged with the attempted murder of a sex worker, Wendy Lynn Estetter, hope I said that right, whom he stabbed several times during the altercation at the farm. Esteiner had informed the police that Picton had handcuffed her, but that she escaped after suffering several lacerations. She told them that he, she had disarmed him and stabbed him with his weapon. You want to know something crazy? In Canada, for self-defense, you can't use a weapon on an intruder if they don't have a weapon. If you do, you'll go down for armed assault. I think that's total bullshit. That's just Canada's self-defense laws. But uh, yeah, let's continue. Picton sought treatment at Eagle Ridge Hospital while Estater recovered at the nearest emergency room. He was released on a $2,000 bond. The charge was dismissed in January, in January 1998. That's wild. Months later, Picton was sued by the Port Coquitlam officials for violating his zoning ordinances, neglecting the agriculture for which it had been zoned, and having altered a large farm building on the land for the purpose of holding dances, concerts, and other recreations. So he's basically sued for uh, not using his own farm for their intended purposes, which is kind of bullshit, but okay. The Pictons ignored the legal pressure and held a 1998 New Year's party. <laughs> the way she goes, just in your face. You're going to sue us for not using it for the right thing? Well, fuck you, we're going to have a party, bro. <laughs> After which they were faced with an injunction banning future parties. That's bullshit right there if you ask me though, for real. The police were authorized to arrest and remove any person attending future events at the farm. The society's non-profit statues was removed the following year for inability to pursue produce financial statements. It was subsequently disbanded. Interesting. So they were just jacking his fun, but I guess that's good if he was uh, using these parties as a cover to kill prostitutes. I do have a cool little tale about this guy, I guess. I have a buddy whose aunt actually partied on his farm back when they were having parties. So that's uh, pretty wild, knowing she was on a serial killer's farm before it was known he was a serial killer. So, over the course of three years, Hiscox, I'm guessing his neighbor, noticed that woman who visited the farm eventually went missing. So, I'm not sure if they went there one time, went missing, or they came multiple times and then one day just never left. I'm guessing it's the latter. On February 6, 2002, police executed a search warrant for illegal firearms on the property. Okay. 
Robert and David Picton were arrested and police obtained a search warrant using what they had seen on the property to search the farm as part of a BC missing woman investigation. Interesting. Personal, personal items belonging to the missing woman were found at the farm, which was sealed off by members of the joint RCMP, which is uh, our feds, basically. They're like nomad feds. And Vancouver Police Department Task Force. So they were working together, the feds and the uh, provincial police. The following day, Picton was charged with weapons offenses. Both of the Pictons were later released. That's just how you tell it's Canada, man. Like, I guarantee in the States, you're probably not getting released for weapons charges. And especially when you have clothing articles and all that stuff of missing women. Like, how does that even work, bro? However, Robert Picton was kept until police... Uh, kept under police surveillance, so only Picton was surveilled. On February 22nd, Robert Picton was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of Serena Abotsway and Mona Wilson. On April 2nd, three more charges were added for the murders of Jacqueline McDonald, Dina Rock, and Heather Bottomley. A sixth charge for murder for the murder of Andrea Josbury was laid on April 9th, followed shortly by a seventh of so another charge of first degree murder 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 for Brenda Wolf on September 20th. Four more charges were added for the slayings of Georgina Pappin. Patricia Johnson, Helen Hallmaker, and Jennifer Furminger. Hope I said that right. And then four more charges for the murders of Heather Chincock. I hope I said that one right too. Tina Holke, Sherry Lerving. And Inga Hall were laid on October 3rd, bringing the total to 15. So he got charged with 15 murders in the span of, like, a few months. It's wild. But I don't know how long he was murdering for. That's the thing. This was the largest investigation of any serial killer in Canadian history. So he's, like, the biggest serial killer known, anyway, in Canadian history. On May 26, 2005, 12 more charges were laid against Picton for the killings of Kara Ellis, Andrea Borhaven, Deborah Lynn Jones, Marine, Maria, Marie, Frey, Tiffany Drew, Carrie Kolsky, Sarah DeVries, Cynthia Felkes, Elkies, Angelina Jarris, Wendy Crawford, Dina Melnick, and Jane Doe, so an unknown, bringing the total number of first degree murder charges to 27. I'm pretty sure most of those 27 murder charges got dropped, but for a murder charge to stick, you do need a substantial amount of evidence, so I don't know how they got dropped. But murder charges are the easiest charges to beat, though, however. So, for most of these cases, they excavated bodies. Excavations continued at the farm throughout November 2003. So, I was like two when this all was going down-ish. The cost of the in investigation is estimated to have been cost at $70 million by the end of 2003, holy. According to the provincial government, as of 2015, the property is fenced off under a line by the Crown in right of British Columbia. In the meantime, all the buildings on the property, except a small barn had been demolished. Interesting. Forensic analysis proved difficult because the bodies may have been left to decompose. Yeah, the Iceman uh, froze the bodies for years sometimes and then de-thawed them. 
and uh, left them somewhere, so they had no clue when they died. They just kind of went missing and turned up, and they didn't know when they died. Um, but yeah, or they were eaten by insects and pigs on the farm, as I said earlier. He fed them to pigs. During the early days of the excavations, forensic anthropologists brought in heavy equipment, including two 50-foot, 15-meter flat cover conveyor belts and soil sifters to find traces of human remains. Damn, so we're like mining for people here. On March 10th, 2004, the warning, another claim was made that he fed the bodies directly to pigs. So he was feeding bodies to pigs, killing them, and then selling those pigs that he fed the bodies to, to supermarkets. So those pigs were raised on human remains. Let that one marinate for a second. So at a preliminary inquiry was held in 2003, the testimony from which was covered by a publication ban until 2010. At the inquiry, the fact was revealed that Picton had been charged with attempted murder in, the connect in, the in connection with the stabbing of a sex worker. Wendy Lynn Eastner in 1997, the one I mentioned earlier. So, uh, yeah, that's attempted murder right there, bro. Yeah. Eastner testified at the inquiry that after Picton had driven her to the port to his farm and had sex with her, he slapped handcuffs on her hand and stabbed her in the abdomen. She stabbed Picton in self-defense. Later, both she and Picton were treated at the same hospital where staff used a key they found in Picton's pocket to remove the handcuffs from the woman's wrist. That's a sealed shut case right there. Sealed shut. Like, what the hell's wrong with our fucking justice system, bro? So the attempted murder charge against Picton was stayed on January 27th, 1998 because the woman had drug addiction issues. And prosecutors believed her too unstable for her testimony to help secure a conviction. Bro, what the hell? She, she was caught with the handcuffs on the wrist. And he had the key for the cuffs in his pocket. And they were at the same place. What the hell? But uh, the clothes and rubber boots Picton had been wearing that evening were sized by police and left in RCMP storage locker for more than seven years. Not until 2004 did the lab testing show the DNA of two missing women was on the item sized for Picton in 1997. So our government's just straight sloppy, bro. Straight sloppy. In 1998, according to Vancouver Police Detective Constable Lorimer Chenier, hope I said that right, Chenier learned of a call made to police tip phone line stating that Picton should be investigated on the case of the woman's disappearances. Holy. So they had a lot of evidence they could have used to arrest this guy, but sloppy police work. According to Schenner's account described at length in his 2015 book about the case, he struggled to attract sufficient police resources and attentions to the case until the 2002 search of Picton's farm by the RCMP. Yeah, straight sloppy work, man. In 1999, Canadian police have received a tip that Picton had a freezer filled with human flesh on his farm. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Canada edition. Although they interviewed Picton, who denied killing the missing woman, and obtained his consent to search his farm, the police never conducted one. Holy... So although they interviewed Picton, who denied killing the missing woman, and obtained his cons So he gave them permission to search his property, but denied any of the killings. The police never searched his property. Bro, this is one of those cases where you just face palm, bro. You're like, what the hell? There, however, isn't much on his uh, early life, so sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, 
but there are many uh biographies and that where he may have mentioned but i'm just uh scratching the surface here Picton's trial began on January 30th, 2006, so I was like five-ish. In New Westminster, Picton pled not guilty to 27 charges of first-degree murder in the Supreme Court of British Columbia. The voyeur... The voyeur phase of the trial took most of the year to determine what evidence might be omitted before the jury... So they get to choose what they get to show the jury. Interesting. Reporters were not allowed to disclose any of the materials presented in the arguments. On March 2nd, one of the 27 counts was rejected by Justice James Williams for lack of evidence. Okay. On the August 9th, Justice Williams served the charges, splitting them into one group of 6 counts for, and another group of 20 counts. So they separated them, made little groups of the counts word. The trial proceeded on the grounds of six counts. The remaining 20 counts could have been heard in a separate trial, but ultimately were stayed on August 4th, 2010. So they were dropped. Because of public ban, full details of the discussion are not publicly available, but the judge has explained that Trying all 26 charges at once would put an unreasonable burden on the jury. As the trial could last up to two years, it also would have had an increased chance for a mistrial. Okay, so they wanted to get him for sure. Like, they didn't want any uh, fucking around, I guess you could see. But I still don't get how you drop 20 counts of murder. Like, damn. The judge added that the six counts he chose had mater had materially different evidence from the other 20, so maybe better evidence. Office of Inspector General Senior Investigator R.J. McDougland was case agent for the investigation. Interesting. So the six murders or whatever had uh, probably better evidence than uh, the other 20, so... Uh, for sure convictions. I don't know why, but my mouth gets all wet and truly when I read. <laughs> Just out of context real hard there. But uh, the date for the jury trial for the first six counts was initially set to start January 8th, 2007, but was later postponed to January 22nd. On that date, Picton faced first-degree murder charges in the deaths of Frey Abstoe, Frey Abstoe, Papin, Josbury, Wolfe, and Wilson. The media ban was lifted, and for the first time, Canadians heard the details of what was found during the long investigation. So... I guess the media ban was good, so he's not crucified right away by the media, but still he's a serial killer. So what was found? Skulls cut in half with hands and feet stuffed inside them. The remains of one victim found stuffed in garbage bags. And her blood-stained clothes found in Picton's trailer. So pretty solid evidence right there. Part of another victim's jawbone and teeth found beside Picton's slaughterhouse... A 22 caliber revolver with an attached dildo containing both his and the victim's DNA. So is he shoving it up his ass or something? Holy. In a videotape recording played for the jury, Picton claimed to have attached the dildo to his weapon as a makeshift silencer. 22s are already pretty quiet, but alright. As of February 20th, 2007, the following information has been presented to the court. During Picton's trial, lab staff testified that about 80 unidentified DNA profiles, roughly half male and half female, have been detected on evidence. So some victims and then others maybe not. Maybe other participants. Maybe he didn't act alone. The items police found inside Picton's trailer, a loaded 22 revolver with a dildo over the barrel, and one round fired boxes of uh, 
.357 Magnum handgun ammunition night vision goggles, two pairs of fox fur lined handcuffs, oh kinky, a syringe with three millimeters of blue liquid inside, and a Spanish fly, whatever that is. A videotape of Picton's friend, Scott Chubb, saying Picton had told him a good way to kill a female heroin addict was to inject her with windshield washer fluid, so maybe that was blue liquid in the syringe. A second tape was played with, played for Picton in which an associate named Andrew Bellwood said Picton mentioned killing sex workers by handcuffing them and strangling them, then bleeding and gutting them before feeding them to pigs. Interesting. So they have uh, some damning video evidence here too. Video confessions. Sorry I talk so fast. I uh, don't want this to drag on too long because I don't want to take up too much of y'all's days, but I thank you for listening if you... uh, made it this far photos of the contents of a garbage can be found in picton slaughterhouse which held some remains of mona wilson in october 2007 a juror was accused of having made up her mind already that picton was innocent how the trial judge questioned the juror saying it's reported to me that you said from what you had seen you were certain picton was innocent there was no way he could have done this that the court system had arrested the wrong guy. The juror denied this completely. Justice Williams ruled that she could remain on the jury since it had not been proven she made the statement. I, if they would have got rid of her, they would have had to do that all over again. But if they, if what she said was true, the trial would have been tainted as well. So that's a double-edged sword right there. And I guess they wanted to save monies. Justice James Williams suspended the jury's deliberation on December 6, 2007 after he discovered an error in his charge to the jury. Earlier in the day, the jury had submitted a written question to Justice James requesting clarification of his charge, asking, are we able to say yes? i.e. find Picton guilty if we infer the accused acted indirectly. How do you act indirectly on six murders and the bodies are found on your property? On December 9th, 2007, the jury returned a verdict that Picton is not guilty on six counts of first-degree murder. How? That's some fuck-ass bullshit right there. But is guilty on six counts of second-degree murder... Um, I don't know, man. It's whack. A second-degree murder conviction carries a punishment of a life sentence with no possibility of parole on a period between 10 to 25 years. So no parole in between 10 and 25 years, but you're going to serve life. Word. All right. To be set by a trial judge on December 11, 2007, after reading 18 victim impact statements, British Columbia Supreme Court Judge Justice J. Williams, James Williams, sentenced picked into life with no possibility of parole for 25 years, the maximum punishment for second degree murder, and equal to the sentence which would have been imposed for first degree murder conviction. I still don't get that charge and how all this works, man. Don't get it. He should have been sentenced to that for each count. Like six counts of uh, second degree murder or whatever. So six life sentences. Like consecutively or concurrently. I don't know. Probably uh, concurrent or consecutive. I don't know. Because I think consecutive is one after another. So consecutive. So he never gets out. Like imagine letting someone out. When you found like 27 bodies on their property and he confessed to 49 murders. That's whack. So after he was sentenced, they basically tried to appeal like, how can you drop, like he was initially charged with six counts of uh, first degree murder. And then they dropped them to second degree murder. And then they tried to appeal the second degree murder for whatever charge they wanted to go for. Maybe like manslaughter. Who knows nowadays. 
well, back then, I don't know. But, like, if they were to appeal them, then, like, the whole reason they were uh, dropped was because of an uh, error or whatever on the judge's part or something like that. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. This case is, like, dumb. It's, like, dumbly obvious he did it because all those bodies were found on his property. But, uh, yeah. So, as I said, on December 9th, 2007, he was uh, found guilty on the six counts of second-degree murder. And then all his appeals or whatever started January 7th, 2008. And they lasted until... Until January 25th, 2009-ish. So, that's a long... A lot of appeals. But, um, yeah, all of these appeals were due to, uh, I think the judges, uh, I wouldn't say insubordination, that's too strong of a word, but the judges mess up or whatever. Because I think it's pretty clear that these were all first degree murders. And, uh, yeah, and convincing the judge to knock it down to, uh, Second degree murder has to come from inside the court somehow, especially with all that evidence, all the confessions and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, if you guys want, the links are in the description so you can go read all these appeals if you're interested. There are also a bunch of documentaries. I've not done the podcast yet. I'm just uh, letting you know. But that was only the trial of the six murder victims. He still faced trials for the further 20 first degree murder charges involving the other victims from Victoria's downtown east side. On February 26, 2008, a family member of one of the 20 women named as alleged victims told the media that the Crown had told her a trial on the further 20 counts might not proceed. Holy. On August 4th, 2010, Crown prosecutors stated that the pending murder charges against Picton, ending the prospect of any further trials. Holy. The 20 charges were formally stated by Crown counsel Melisa Gillespie, Shortly after 4 p.m. during a British Columbia Supreme Court hearing at New Westminster, most but not all of the publication bans in the case were lifted by the trial judge James William of the British Columbia Supreme Court after lawyers spent hours in court going through the various complicated bans. On August 6, 2010, various media outlets released a transcript of the conversation between an RCMP undercover operator and Picton in his holding cell. Yep. While the RCMP censored the undercover officer's name throughout most of the document, his name was left uncensored in several portions of the document that the RCMP released to the public. That's a fail. This uncensored version was available to the public through Global News, CTV News, and Vancouver Sun for about an hour before being pulled and re-edited. It is not known the extent of the damage this mistake caused the undercover officer. Holy. But yeah, this just sounds like pure laziness on the government's half. Like, you just can't drop 20 cases of murder against women or whatever. And, yeah, that's just whack. I have no words. That's Canada for you. And I've never heard of a trial like this one. This is just overly complicated. Because look at Ted Bundy and all those other killers. Like, they may have not killed as many people as he did. But he was caught with all the evidence, their bodies. And they're like, okay, we'll charge them six at a time. And then we'll... Maybe do the other 20. Just do them all at once. Too much stress on the jury, bro. Like, come on, bro. Come on. So, the first count he was charged with, the woman disappeared in 2001. And that's when she was last seen. And then... The last victim, Kara Lewis-Ellis, a.k.a. Nikki Timbolt, 
Tumblr. I got no clue how to say that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm dumb sometimes. Um, 25 was last seen in 1996. Holy. And was reported missing October, October 20, 2002. That's wild. So he's been killing for a long time. Long, long time. After Picton was arrested, many people started to come forward to talk to police about what had taken place at the farm. One of the witnesses that came forward was Lynn, the girl who was uh, almost murdered by the hands of Picton, and they were in the same hospital together. Lynn claimed to have seen Picton skinning a woman hanging from a meat hook years earlier and that she did not tell anyone about it out of fear for losing her life. Additionally, Lynn admitted that she blackmailed Picton using this uh, against him on more than one occasion. The victim's children filed a civil lawsuit in May of 2013 against the Vancouver Police Department, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police RCMP, the Crown for failing to protect the victims. They searched a settlement. They reached a settlement in March of 2014 where each of the children was to be compensated fifty thousand dollars without admission of liability yeah they could have handled that much sooner and much quicker much sooner and much quicker man that's all i can see but yeah picton has been writing people about the case all that type of stuff and these are confirmed because the outgoing stamps are consistent of those from the North Phaser Prenal Center, where Picton is being held, confirmed through representatives of Canadian Canada Post that her outgoing stamps are not forages. And uh, yeah, so they're confirmed. And he's had a few films made of him in 2015. A film with the working title of Full Flood began production in Vancouver, word. In 2016, an autobiography written by Picton himself, entitled Picton in his own words, went up for sale and initiated controversy, critical pensions and actions by the government to prevent Picton from profiting from his work. Makes sense. Picton was described as getting his manuscript out of the prison by passing it to a former cellmate who then sent it to a retired construction worker from California named Michael Childers who typed it up and credited it as the author for the 400 on um, 400 144 page book provincial solicitor general Mike Morris and an online petition at change.org each sought to remove the book from sales on Amazon word so he has a book a movie and uh, he's writing leather letters to people. That's uh, what most serial killers, well not most, some serial killers do. But uh, yeah, like, could you imagine cutting up a body and feeding it to pigs? And then knowing that that came from his farm? And maybe you knew him and then you found out you were eating pigs or whatever that were fed bodies. That would be something else something else in all but uh yeah uh, it would be crazy to have known him and like yeah he's a weird guy but i never th would have thought he murdered almost 50 people but i yeah i still won't be able to get over the lack of initiative initiative by the government like he should have been captured like way before he was and a lot more work should have went into uh his case or whatever because 20 cases dropped that's bullshit so that is robert picton thank you for listening to this episode on the murder house radio show check out the social medias and the sources in the description see you next episode this is your host x signing off